Welcome back to another Construct video and in this video I want to show you a concept I've been working on for a tile based RPG where you can buy tiles to complete the map and make the map bigger. So how's it all work? Well, let's get started. So first thing we need is some tiles. Now I've just got four different tiles but you can have as many as you want. So for mine I've got a shore, a beach, grass and some mountains. Now I've got a load of variables here and these are just doing some calculations. We'll talk about these when we get to them. But the first one I want to talk about is the tile size. Now this is really interesting. This is just how big each tile is and it will redo all the calculations based on this new size. So if you want larger tiles, so you have to travel further to get to the next tile, then you can increase that size. If you want smaller tiles, you can do that as well. We've also got this option called noise. Now this one's a really interesting one because this is how random our terrain tends to be. If we put noise down to zero, we should only get one tile up here. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take this uh, action here, undisable it, and this is going to complete the map for us. So you can see this is our completed map now. So it's just all grass, one texture all the way through. If we change the noise to five, you can now see that we've got a lot more variation in our map. You still have to travel quite far to get out of big regions. So there's big sand regions, there's a lot of water that we have to get through. But again, there's a lot more variation in the land now. Up in a noise to 20 means that actually we can still see our patterns of there are beaches around water, but we've now got a lot smaller regions. And again, we've now got some crossover happening that didn't happen before, such that we can go straight from a shore to grass. And if our noise is too high, it just becomes a little bit random. So we just need to take into account about what noise is suitable for our needs. So let's start at the beginning. First thing I'm going to do is going to use the advanced random to set a random seed. Now you would have heard the term seed from stuff like Minecraft. If you put the same seed in, you get the same result. This works exactly the same with our advanced random. So I've set the seed to random, but you could quite easily set this to five. And then next time you play it, if you type five again, you get the same result. So you could even give the user that control if they want a random seed or they want to put in the same seed as before. Next we've got an array, I'm going to set the size for how many tiles we've got and we'll talk about how we generate the values for each of the tiles. Also going to destroy any tiles that already exist so we can create fresh ones from the beginning. Next bit of code might look very familiar to my ship concept that I've made before and did a tutorial on and that's because the code is very similar. The only difference with the ship concept is we generate the big map in one go and we scaled the camera up quite far. This time we're only generating one tile at a time and we're zooming the camera up quite far down. So we're repeating for how many tiles we've got. And what we're going to do is we're going to set the value of each element in the array. Now, if you don't know what array is, think of an array just as a table. So for each table position, we're going to set the value to this lovely calculation here. Now, don't be put off too much by this. Essentially, what we're using is we're using something called the advanced random classic 2D function. This just asks for an X and Y position and generates a number based off this. Now, the closer the values are to each other, the similar value they're going to return. So if, for instance, they had the value of five, the neighboring one might have the value of six. And then what we can do is we can say, OK, if the value is five, it's water. If the value is six, it's also water. If the value is seven, it's now grass. So that's all it's doing. However, we're having to do a couple of things to put it into a format that we like. First of all, we're times in the X and Y by a noise value. If we don't do this, we end up with just one train tile. So by times it by noise, we add a further distance between each of the tiles. I'm also doing a calculation to get it in between the values of zero and one. Now, currently the values generated without any of this extra calculations being done will be between 0.22 and 0.77. So a tiny bit of rough maths has put it between zero and one. Again, don't worry too much about this. Main point of this video today is for you to understand how to use the tool, not how to recreate it. Next, we check if we're on our final square. If so, we know that the layout has now been created, so we can now start moving to spawning the player. Now, before we look at spawning the player, let's look at how we actually create the tiles. So first of all, we've got these variables here, and these are our chances of spawning the different tiles. Now, the values look a little bit weird because if you look, the shore chance should be higher than all the others. So let me explain how this all works. For the mountain chance, we're looking for a number between 0 and 0 0.25. Again, our array is generating numbers between 0 and 1. 
So we have a 25% chance that we're going to spawn a mountain. For our grass chance, we're looking at a number between 0 0.256 and 0 0.63. So it's between these two numbers we'll generate our grass tiles. For our beaches, any number between 0 0.64 and 0 0.78 will now generate our beach tiles. And finally, for our sure chance, we're looking at any number between 0, 7, 9 and 1. So these are just ranges, and we're looking at numbers between these ranges. Obviously, if you wanted extra tiles, you can just add extra global variables. Next, we're going to create a tile. So this takes in two parameters. It takes in the grid X and the grid Y. So grid X and grid Y just allows us to look up the value in the array. And then we can return that value to this local number called TV. So you can see set TV to array at grid X, grid Y. Then we just check if that's less than or equal to the mountain spawn rate, so 0 0.25. If it is, we can create a mountain. And what we're going to do is create it at grid X times the tile size and grid Y times the tile size. So again, that puts it in the correct position on the map. We also just want to set the tile to be the size of the tile size. So if you've increased the tile size to say 1,000, then the mountain will be a thousand by a thousand. We've then got an else and then we check for the grass spawn. So now we check actually if it's not less than 2.5, is it now less than 0 0.63? If so, spawn grass. Else is it less than our 0 0.78 spawn a beach? Is it less than one? And again, it should be less than one because our calculation always makes sure there's a number between zero and one. So this function here allows us to spawn a single tile. Now what I've done is I've added an action just here called create tile. Now this is going to be disabled by default when you load this program. But if you undisable this, it will load up the whole map in one go. This is how I was able to do that demo where I showed off the noise levels. However, if not, we want to actually trigger this by walking close to a tile and then pressing the E key, just like you saw in the intro. So now that we can create tiles, how do we spawn the player into this world? Well. All we need to do is we're going to set the player's position to be completely random inside our layout. Next, we're going to use this tile X and tile Y. And what this does is calculate exactly which tile the player is in. So we see this tile X. Now, this round function of looks like we're just dividing times by the same thing. But this rounds it to the nearest 300 in my case, which is the tile size. So this allows us to calculate exactly which X tile it's in, exactly which Y tile it's in. And then we can return the value of that tile. Again, look in our array to find out exactly where that tile is located. And then we can just do a simple check to see if they're on a tile that we like. So for this, I'm just basically saying they can't spawn in a mountain. So I'm checking it's great in the mountain spawn chance. Now, in terms of this one, this one's a bit weird because we're doing less than. And our sure chance is less than one. However, shores can spawn from uh, 0 0.79, which is where beaches end. So if I don't want it to spawn in the short, I have to put the beach spawn chance. And now it can only spawn on grass or beach. So a little bit of a weird maths there. It's just how we're calculating the tiles. But again, once we're happy, we can create a tile for that player in the tile position they're currently in. If not, we're just going to run the function again, which will put them in a new random location. We can check if their spawn point is desirable and keep repeating that until they're in a tile that we like. Now, one thing I didn't really show off yet, but... If we move around this map, it's a bit hard to see because you can't see what I'm doing on the keyboard, but I can't leave this boundary. No matter how hard I try, I'm stuck in this tile. If I buy a new tile, I can now move in this boundary, but now I'm stuck in this new boundary once again. So you're always stuck on the map. You can't enter sort of the gray foggy area. You have to buy the tiles in order to move. And until you buy those tiles, the play is stuck. So how have we worked out this collision? So the first thing is we've got is we've got some new image points onto the player. So we've got top, left, bottom, and right. And these are really important because we're going to attach a sprite to each one of these positions. So we can see on the start of layout, we're going to spawn a collision point. And this is just a small dot. And we're going to set it to the image point of top. Once we set it to the image point, we can then pin it to the player so it doesn't move. And we're also going to set the location to top now the location is just a variable attached to the collision point and that's really important so we can distinguish between the four collision points and then we set it invisible just disabling the invisibility for a second you can see there's our four collision points there and all we're doing is we're just checking if they're out of bounds we're going to stop the player from moving so let's have a look at the code for that so you can see that we've just got four blocks of repeated code 
for our four different directions. And I'm using W, S, and D for this, but obviously you can change this to the arrow keys if you like, or a games controller. So if we start with forwards, we're first going to check if we're holding W. Again, you can use the arrow keys or the gamepad for this. We're first going to check if the collision point is overlapping tiles. If it's not overlapping tiles, it means it's now out of bounds, and we don't like that. We also want to check if the collision point is the one at the top. Because again, they're moving forwards, so we don't care about the others, we only care about the one at the top when they're moving forwards. So, if the collision point's in bounds, and we're looking at the one at the top, then we'll allow them to move forward. If not, we're going to stop the eight directions to stop them moving. Now, one thing that's really important with this is we have to set the deacceleration to be pretty, really high. Because if not, if they let go of the keys, they can actually push themselves out of bounds. So, I haven't got to fix this at the moment but just make sure your deacceleration is really high so you stop instantly. Next, we just repeat this for the other direction. So for going down, we just check if the collision point that's looking down is overlapping a tile. If it's not overlapping a tile, then we need to stop it because it's out of bounds. And this just allows us to stay in bounds for just the tiles that we've unlocked and not go anywhere else on the map. Now, if you're a free user, you might be questioning of, can I do this out of family? Yes, you could. The downside is as you look at our events, you need to have this four times for each of the tiles. This will probably put you over the event limit. So I was working out if I could do the tutorial without using families. Unfortunately not because the event number would probably be too high. However, if you are on the free version, you could actually remove this collision check completely. And instead of generating the tiles one at a time, just show the complete map. So you can still make use of this tutorial if you're on the free version. So we now move on to the final thing, which is actually buying the tiles, or in this case, just unlocking them but you can add a money system to this instead. So you have to buy the tiles to move on to the next location. So first thing we've got is we've got this thing called a button trigger. It's just a simple animation. I've got one for being active and not active. So you can see if you are in range of it or not. And this has two very useful variables, grid X and grid Y. And essentially when we create it, we're just gonna store which grid it will unlock. So we've got a function called update tile buttons. Now, this triggers when a player moves from an old grid to a new grid. So you can see it jumping between the two options there. And again, we're just keeping track of which grid the player is currently in. And when they move to a new grid, we update that. And you can see if we buy an option, so we can see that we've got an option to buy a tile here. And we've got the same option to buy the tile here. We no longer have the option of here anymore because we brought that tile. So it's only showing us tiles that we can buy that are brand new. So in closure and movement, we've got a very simple check here. So we're just, first of all, setting the old tile X to tile X and the old tile Y to tile Y. And we just check before we update that, has that value changed? So has the player moved from a different tile X or a different tile Y? If they've done any, they've moved to a different tile, update the tile buttons, and then again, we'll reset the old tile X to tile X and the old tile Y to tile Y, ready for the player to move to a new set of tiles after. So what's this function do? The first thing it's going to do is destroy any buttons that already exist so we can create some brand new ones. So after we destroy the buttons, we then need to create four new ones for the four different directions. Then we need to create some new button triggers. So the first bit of this code here, all it's doing is working out which tile is the player currently in. And then we're going to minus the tile size divided by four. And this just places it slightly to the left of the tile that we're currently in. We repeat this for the different directions. The only difference is we're going to add the tile size divided by four to place it slightly right of the tile we're currently in. And then we also do the same for up and down. So we've got up there and finally down, we add four. For each one as well, we're going to set the grid X they're currently in. So again, same thing that we did with the player, same calculation we did to work out which tile the player's in. We're doing the same one for the button. So when we use the button to buy a new tile, we know exactly which tile we're buying. So we've got our four different buttons. However, you'll notice in some examples I showed you, you can't always buy four different locations. You might have already brought the one to the right, or you could actually be at the end of the map as well. So this is where this code comes in. We're going to skip the first bit. And for each button, what we're doing, first of all, checking if the value is greater than sure spawn chance. We actually don't need this anymore because I've done some changes in the code. But again, if you've got a value greater than one, we want to destroy the button tile. And this is the big one. If it's overlapping a tile, we destroy it. 
So when we move to a new tile, it'll create four different buttons. It'll check if those buttons are overlapping any tiles, which means we've already brought that tile, destroy the button, and then we can't use the button to create a new tile from there. So really, really simple there. We've also got an animation that happens, and this is just checking the player's distance. So this little function here just checks the distance from the player to the button. And if it's less than the tile size divided by three, so mine's 300, so if you're 100 blocks in range, then we're gonna do two things. One, we're gonna set the animation to be active. So this changes it to a blue instead of a gray. And we're just gonna add the sign behavior. And it's just gonna do this effect here. And this just stops as a click me effect. So this is just using a sine wave to change the size. Two seconds, magnitude of five. And again, this just highlights to the player. This is something you want to click on, something you want to press. And on the flip side of that, we we'll use an else to just check if you're not in that range, disable it and set the animation to be not active. Finally, if you press the E key and the animation is active, which we know only plays if we're in that range, then we create a tile. And again, to create a tile, you need to provide a grid X and grid Y, which you've already attached to the button using our clever formula. So that is actually the full code. Now I've added just three more little options at the bottom, and this is just to make your life a little bit easier. One, we've got holding the M key down, and this will set a scale right back. It will put the camera in the center of the screen, and it makes the play much bigger. So this will allow you to see actually almost like what the map looks like at a current time. And then if you let go of the M key, it will do the opposite of that. I've also got the option to restart layout. Again, as mentioned, you can also undisable this, and this will create a map in one go. So you can see that I can press the M key and create a map in one go. I can press the R key to reset. And again, you'll see my player teleporting around the screen. Obviously, the idea is that you get tiles one at a time. So you've got a lot of tiles to get if you want to complete this sort of game. Um, but again, it will also move the player around the screen as well into different locations, giving us a randomly generated game each time. So as always, this code will be available in the description. I just want to just quickly show you a project that I'm working on based on this. And this just shows you how far you can take it. So again, a lot of this should look quite familiar from what we've seen in the code. The difference is we've added the player sprites, some animations, and an actual value system now, so we have to pay money to unlock the sprites. I've also unlocked some different tiles, so tiles can now spawn with trees and grass and cactuses. And you can start to see how you can expand this into a real life RPG. I've also added some nice little animations if you're in the water or the sand. And again, you can start to see how the map starts forming together to create something that looks like a real life map. So we've got water next to beaches. I know that if I want to escape this water, I probably need to move back to the beach. There we go. So I can escape that land. I've also got a map as well that's showing the current tiles. So this is using a clever trick for that as well. Um, so I'll keep you updated on the progress of this game because I'm getting quite into this. Um, and this will be a bit of a survival RPG. Not to a full extent of a full RPG, it's going to be much more simpler than that because RPGs are very time consuming to make. So this one is a lot more manageable for my time. Um, but that is it for today. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.